Hi, everyone. Welcome to week five of the summer term. I'm Professor Rios. Hope you're doing well. Uh, this week is all about the shaping of landscapes, water as a geomorphic agent, karst topography, which does involve water, and wind as a geomorphic agent or an agent that shapes landscapes. So that's basically, it's basically shaping of landscapes. That's what the basic theme of the week happens to be, okay? Uh, let's get started with the first section. And they're not particularly long. This image here is from Yosemite National Park in California. And these are the objectives for the lesson. Weathering, erosion, and mass movement is sort of the overarching theme of the lesson. So associating the climate type with the weathering type that you experience in a particular region. So the geomorphology part two. So the last, last week we talked about part one, which had to do with the building of land. This is how the land gets torn down. So this is gravity, of course. You have water, water again in the form of groundwater, wind and water in arid landforms, glacial processes, so frozen water, and coastal processes and landforms, this would be waves. So these two are next week. These four are this week. So in the end, everything is either being built up by tectonic processes or it's being weathered and reshaped by weathering mass movement and erosion. So there's a constant back and forth that is taking place <clears throat> between those two large scale events, which ends up shaping the land as you see it. So weathering is something that's a function of temperature, precipitation, the material and the angle, the aspect. And it's the in-place disintegration of rock material. Erosion, on the other hand, is a function of whatever is doing the actual work. So water, wind, and ice. And the movement of that material by those three. Mass movement is a subset of erosion. It's a function of gravity and precipitation. So mass movements can be very wet and and fast, they can be very dry and slow, or they can be anywhere in between. So here we have the Grand Canyon, which is really one of the, <coughs> excuse me, one of the most significant examples of weathering and erosion anywhere in the planet. Uh, we're talking about a landscape that was uplifted, and then once it was uplifted, it was and continues to be eroded uh, away. Here's an example of weathering in a dry environment. This happens to be a desert, clearly. But even in a desert, you see the shape of water and the effect of water in the form of these sort of dry river uh, finger-like structures, okay? So even here, water is very evident. Uh, mass movement is the downslope movement of material typical in response to gravity and usually aided by water. It's not a necessary, but it is often aided by water. Water makes the process easier. Here are some examples. For example, this river, which happens to be very filled with sediment, sand dunes, or after much rainfall, the downslope movement of material, a landslide, uh, a rock slide, whatever the case might be. Uh, for weathering, there are three, two types, mechanical or physical. These are often experienced in dry climates and cold climates, but you can experience them in wet ones as well. And chemical weathering, which is when water is involved, and it is often found in hot, wet, or A climates. And that's one of the questions in your homework. Other physical weathering processes or mechanical, however you want to call it, you have frost action. When water seeps in and expands, the idea of salt crystals 
forming and expanding and breaking down rock and exfoliation, which I'll show you an example of coming up. So here's an example of water seeping into a crack and breaking up an otherwise smooth looking stone into something where it broke along a particular plane and you can literally pull that rock apart with your fingers. And this is the repeated freezing and thawing of, of uh, water. Here's an example of rock that has been eliminated or removed from up here and it ends up in big jagged chunks at the bottom of this hill. Here is something called a talus cone. All this stuff you see here, where did it come from? Up here. So this happens to be in northern Canada, a place that is very cold. There's not a lot of rain or snow, but whatever does fall freezes, expands, and it breaks down the material. Here's an example of frost wedging. Again, when water seeps in, freezes, it expands, and then it breaks apart the rock. Here's an example of exfoliation, which is caused by the release of confining pressure. Uh, the, basically, the rocks will peel away in slabs or peels, as it were. And what happens is this material may have been at one point underground. So there is the pressure of the earth above it. Then that pressure is removed when the erosion takes place. And then the material begins to break down. These are some of the better examples on Earth. These are called exfoliation domes. Here's one, here's a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth. They are everywhere along the Yosemite Valley in California. Uh, this is the most famous one of them all. It's called Half Dome. And here you can see the, um, the peels. And uh, notice how smooth. This is one really, really big chunk of granite, okay? Salt wedging is like frost wedging, but it is weaker. When salt crystals form and they grow and they pry the rock open. These are often found in drier BW or BS climates. Roots can do the very similar set of work Roots are remarkably powerful. So what a root can do is basically get in and as it grows, it breaks apart the rock. Chemical weathering, on the other hand, is the actual chemical alteration of rock. And the, the rates are higher in warmer, moister climates or A climates. And the lower rates tend to be in colder, drier climates. These are the three different processes, carbonation, oxidation, and hydrolysis. So carbonation, for example, comes from basic rainfall. You have water, rain, carbon dioxide in the air, they, they mix and they form a weak acid called carbonic acid. And carbonic acid is something that is naturally acidic. All rain that you experience in your entire life is rain that is normally at a pH lower than seven which means it is slightly acidic. Carbonic acid reacts with things like calcium and it dissolves it over time, creating a very distinctive landscape that we'll talk about in a lesson coming up. So I think it's the third part of this. Here's an example of a topographic map of Florida. And here you see all kinds of dimples and, and circular mini lakes. And this is the landscape in Florida is mostly limestone and it has been dissolved over time. Here's what a sinkhole looks like. Worst possible scenario here. Oxidation is nothing more than rust. So you mix iron with oxygen and you create iron oxide, which is weaker. And that weaker material is called rust. Uh, this is in Utah, and there you have iron in the rock. As the water dribbles down, it oxidizes it, and it basically paints the rock a very darker 
ochre color. It's called desert varnish. Um, you're not responsible for that term. It's just sort of an interesting, uh, almost like a natural paint that alters the color of the rock. Mass movements, well, as stated here, they can be very, very slow or very, very fast. They can be very, very dry and very, very wet. They can be very, very dry and slow. They can be very, very dry and fast. Um, so there's a, a variety of them. Uh, mass movements, again, you have this thing called the angle of repose. And if that angle is exceeded, basically the material will come under the force of gravity and slide down. By the way, there are some really good videos on the class uh, or the section playlist on the YouTube page that shows you various examples of mass movement caught on video. Again, they can be very, very slow or they can be very, very fast. Here's an example of a river that has been redirected as a function of this material sliding down very, very quickly. And this is a mud flow in a Chinese city. Mud flows are very, very dangerous. They're very, very fast, and they're really difficult to get away from. Earth flows fall somewhere in between slow and fast. Uh, oftentimes they will give some amount of warning, but oftentimes they are sudden. Uh, as you can see here, it has affected a significant number of homes in this particular area as of when this happened. There are some examples, again, from Taiwan, Japan, Tennessee, and Italy. These are found, again, on the YouTube um, playlist for this particular section. I recommend you see them. The Taiwan especially is one of my favorites because nobody got hurt, but... It's a really scary video that shows you the power of water in a very particularly um, steep location. So that's the first lesson, the first part of the lesson. So now we move on to, oh, let me uh, minimize that. I'm going to close this one. And now we're going to move on to part two. So this is mostly about fluvial systems uh, and the power of water as a function of erosion. So these are the objectives. Go back to that. And... When it comes to the idea of the fluvial landscape lesson, it's what the effect of what water does and how transportation of eroded material by water, how it basically moves along particular channels. So here we're talking about running water and even in desert landscapes, water is the most erosive agent. If you remember anything about this lesson, even in desert landscapes where water is very scarce, it is the most significant erosive agent. Okay? So here's an example of the Indus River through the desert of Pakistan. And as you can see, there's no trees, there's hardly any vegetation here. And water is very significant in the scarring that it has left behind. Yes, wind can do a lot of erosion and movement of material, but water is the most significant. Here's some stream basics. We'll talk about, for example, here happens to be anything you see in the blue shaded area happens to be uh, where... All the water that falls in here will drain through the Mississippi Delta. So this is called a catch basin. So big rivers like the Mississippi, the Ohio, the Missouri, the Arkansas, the Red, uh, the Tennessee, uh, the Kansas, the, uh, the Platte, 
all these rivers will empty their contents through the Mississippi Delta. Okay. Some basic tenets of water. Obviously, it takes the path of least resistance and it erodes as a function of velocity. So when water is moving fast, it, it can carry with it big stuff and lots of it. As water begins to slow down, stuff begins to fall and deposit as a function of size because the water is slowing down. So it can't carry as much stuff as far and it can't carry big stuff anymore, okay? So these are some of the fluvial, fluvial processes, erosion, transportation, and deposition, just like wind. But here, water and is doing the work. Some of the functions of stream erosion, it can do hydraulic action, the force of water, abrasion, which is sandblasting. Imagine lots of stuff in water and that water moving fast. So of all those bits of stuff, sand, rock, pebbles, are going to do work on the landscape and reshape it. And then corrosion is a form of chemical weathering. So these are this is how streams transport material. They do it in dissolved load, suspended load, which is the majority of it. And the other would be bed load, which is what's what what gets dragged along the bottom of a river, meaning the big stuff. And here from your textbook, again, suspended load, and then traction, which is either skipping along or being dragged along the bottom. Here's an image from Papua New Guinea, a tropical climate where they get lots and lots of rainfall. As you can see, these rocks are not moving, but you can imagine these are pretty big boulders. What kind of water velocity would it be required to move this stuff? What would you need to move it? So that gives you an idea of, you know, the fact that it is a function of water velocity and size of material. Here's an example of a river that is very, very, very choked in sediment. So this tells you that there's a lot of mud and silt and sand. Therefore, the water is not, this is not dirty. It's just filled with sediment. This is what rivers do. Um, so you can tell that there's been a lot of rainfall in this particular area for an extended period of time. So the idea of deposition is that, oh, let's go back to that. When the velocity decreases, the capacity and the competence, that's the ability to carry big stuff and lots of stuff in the water will go down as well. And then sediment will begin to fall and sort by size. This is what's called an alluvial fan. So this is a road right here to give you a sense of scale. Imagine all the rain coming down this gorge, this canyon, it's flowing really, really, really fast. And then the canyon ends right about here and then it opens. So naturally all the water begins to spread out. And as it spreads out, it slows down. And because it slows down, it begins to deposit material. Going back to this right here, okay? So when you do that, you create a very stratified uh, landscape. And again, this is called an alluvial fan. So the bigger chunks will be found up here. By the time you get way down here, the material is very, very, very small and thin and gravelly. Whereas up here, you're talking about big, big boulders of material. Uh, stream channels, meandering and braided are the two significant ones. So here's an example of meandering. It's like a, like a hose on the ground. It back and forth, back and forth. Uh, here's an example of a meandering stream in a river 
uh, along the East Texas coast. Notice the different meanders along the way. Here's an example of a wildly meandering river in Alaska. The idea of an oxbow lake is a river that bends. So here's A, B, C, and D. Eventually the river can't make this crazy turn anymore and it just takes the easier path, leaving behind this sort of oxbow lake. And if you go back to this image, here's one. Notice how the river is now flowing like this. And in this other image in Alaska, there are tons of them. I mean, you can count at least 10 oxbow lakes in this particular image. And braided is one that is so full of sediment and where the water is variable, meaning there's a lot of flow during one time of the year and less flow during another. So the material ends up sort of, the water ends up finding its way around it. So you basically are left with little islands in the middle of the river with little vegetated islands and so on. So here's an example of one. Notice how you can almost see the braiding here. Here's another example in Alaska near a glacier. And glaciers are perfect examples of braided streams because water flow is seasonal. In summer, there's more water. In winter, there's less. And glaciers are carrying a lot of stuff with them. Here's another example from Alaska. The idea of widening a valley. Well, the floodplain is widened as the river meanders through that particular area. So the river is doing the flattening of the floodplain. And so that means that the river has occupied that particular area called the floodplain. And everything on either side of it has not been covered or occupied by the river. And that's how it builds. Here's an example of a floodplain. This happens to be in Utah. That river is meandering. Here's another example of a flooded plain. You can actually see the river here. The river has flooded, overflowed its banks and it has occupied the entire floodplain. Here's an example of point bars and cut banks where the water is flowing very fast, it cuts away. Where the water is flowing slow, it creates a point bar of accumulated sand. Notice bar, cut bank, bar, cut bank, bar, cut bank, bar, cut bank. So they usually oppose one another in terms of side of the river. All rivers don't have this, only meandering rivers of a certain type do. A delta, a delta is either, it's often found as a river exits land and goes into the ocean and there is no strong current outside. So two famous ones would be the Mississippi River Delta and the Nile, of course. Here's an example of where it is today, but where it has been in the past for the Mississippi anyway. And here's a Mississippi Delta from space. So the city of New Orleans is right here. Here's the river and notice how much sediment it is carrying and how much sediment is being carried by the color of the water, which is not really blue, but rather milky white or milky brown, like milk, chocolate milk, because there's so much sediment coming down, okay? All right, so the next lesson will be part three, which is karst topography. There'll be some repetition from the previous lesson. So let's get into that.
This happens to be uh, Yangtze River in China. These are the objectives for the lesson, just three of them. So we talked about this already. Again, natural rainwater is acidic. And what you get is a landscape called karst. So for example, Florida, Kentucky, Texas, part of Missouri, part of Oklahoma, Arkansas, New Mexico, you find this type of landscape in the United States. Carbonic acid reacts with calcium and dissolves it quickly. Limestone, for example, is 90% calcium. These are different materials that are easily dissolved in water. Karst topography, again, um, it has to be in an area that is mostly made up of that material. Florida is particularly well known for it because Florida is like a big giant chunk of limestone. And as a result, Florida has a really bad problem with sinkholes. Okay. Uh, cars will form slowly in drier climate and faster in humid ones. And that's because of the idea of chemical weathering. Chemical weathering is facilitated in hotter, wetter climates. So for example, Caribbean karst is much, much fast forming than say temperate karst. Okay. Here's a role of relief in the uh, formation of uh, this type of landscape. and the role of groundwater. Water will sort of find its way underneath the surface, creating pathways and canals and uh, caverns and sinkholes. So it's a whole, a whole way of forming the landscape that you would expect. If you go back to this image here, you're talking about the idea of a cave network, okay? Here's the example. Let's actually look at, there it is, the image of a temperate cars. You can have sinkholes that have collapsed. You have the whole cavern. If you've ever been to a set of caverns with all these very distinctive uh, land features, you can have disappearing uh, streams that seemingly go into the ground and never come back. That's because that river becomes an underground river. So disappearing streams and sinkholes. There are two types of sinkholes. They're either solution or collapse. Those are the two types of sinkholes that, that are typically found. Here's an example of a uh, solution one. It looks like a big bowl. There's that image again from Florida. Uh, tropical cars is very fast forming and Caribbean ca cars as well. And here's an example from the state of Florida. And what you can see here in, the, in this image, this happens to be central Florida, is if you look closely at the image, you will see lots of circular lakes. These are all sinkholes that have been filled with the water. So if you take a chance and have some time, use Google Earth and start looking closely at this. And it will give you a sort of a better visual idea of what this happens to be. So Florida, you know, beautiful weather, people love it because it's warm year round, it doesn't snow. But one of the big concerns in a state like Florida, because it is limestone, is the idea of many, many sinkholes in the area. Here's the idea of caverns and related features. So if you've ever been to a cavern, you've seen these stalactites and stalagmites. This is dissolved um, calcium carbonate, which the water carries, and it creates these deposits that are very, very beautiful. This is where you tend to find either major limestone regions, 
or major karst regions. The reason this area here in Africa is not perhaps a karst region is because it's very dry, so it lacks water. And therefore, it hasn't been dissolved to any great extent. These are some of the features that you can find. Karst Towers. And here's one of the more exaggerated but real examples in a place like southeastern China. And finally, the last lesson, wind as a geomorphic agent. So wind can be a very powerful shaping of the landscape, as you can see here by these beautiful sand dunes. Uh, but again, even in a desert, water is the most effective agent, although we're talking about wind in the case of this particular lesson. These are the objectives for the lesson. These are some of the key concepts and terms. So what the idea of aeolian, A-E-O-L-I-A-N, implies wind caused. So the role of wind, if you look at this image or that image or this image, here you can see that wind in these particularly dry areas has had a significant impact on the way it looks. You can see the ripples. Here's an example of a desert basin in China. It's called the Taklamakan Desert. It sits north of the Himalayan mountains and south of China and east of Kyrgyzstan and all these different places. So this here is a big giant pile of sand that looks like that. Here, wind is clearly very, very dominant more so than water in this particular case. But when water does fall here, it can make significant changes. And that again is the power of water. Here's an example of a desert landscape in Australia. And so wind, wind speed is important. Um, sand grains of about 0.1 millimeters are most easily removed and moved by by wind, um, they result in moving grains of sand along the bottom or near the ground, which cause quite a bit of abrasion. And deserts are not all created the same. Some of them are rocky, some of them are sandy. So this happens to be uh, the desert in the southwestern United States. About one third of the planet is considered arid or semi-arid. And if you link it back to the idea of uh, pressure and the global atmospheric circulation, you either find it around 30 degrees north or 30 degrees south, or you find it in the lee side of mountains, or you find it near cold ocean currents. Either of those three are ones that promote desert and desert generation and maintenance. Here's an example of the Arabian Peninsula in uh, Southwest Asia. So Oman, the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Yemen. And here you can see how over millennia, the sands have been basically shaped around the higher rockier material near it. Here's an example for um, in Uzbekistan, in Kazakhstan. So it's the Aral Sea, which was drastically reduced in size since the 1960s. Uh, as the water that used to feed it was diverted away, and as a result, it created an environmental catastrophe uh, where 
it was reduced in size by quite a bit. There have been significant economic effects as, as a result, and the area has been turned into a desert that is now filled with sands that are contaminated with pesticides and fertilizer. And because it is a dry climate and a very wildly changing climate, the winds then take all that material and spread it far and wide, causing all kinds of respiratory disease in the area. It also had the effect of removing the water has made the winters colder and the summers warmer. And here's what happened. 89, 2003, 2009, 2018. It's not gone entirely, but it is about 90 to 93% gone. And as a result, all this sediment that used to be at the bottom of the lake or sea is now susceptible to wind and movement away from that area. Here's the idea of dust and sand as a result of that wind that we mentioned. So here's the effect of changing a landscape uh, through human in, uh, interaction. The water is no longer there, so therefore that material is now susceptible to wind storms. So the role of wind in arid regions, just like water, except there's no fluid in the form of like liquid. There's fluid in the form of air. But it's the basic idea. Erosion still takes place. You still transport it and you still deposit it somewhere else. And here's some examples. And the transportation is roughly the same, except there is no dissolved material. It's suspended and there's also traction and saltation. Here's the power of wind, how it can shape rock through abrasion. Think of it as sandblasting. And the idea of transport in suspension. Therefore, go dunes and get into Lowe's deposits. Lowe's deposits are sort of yellow and tan in color, and they usually tend to be deposited in big, big, giant piles. You do find them in the United States. You find them in China. You find them all over the world. I mean, not every part of the world, but lots of areas of the world. In the United States, we're talking about the Midwest. Um, because of climate, it can lead to significantly rich um, agriculture. So we're talking about states like Illinois and Indiana and the Mississippi River and Kansas, Nebraska, and so on. But you also find them in China, these big, big lows, plateaus that they have there. So that's it. That's it for this particular week. I know it's a lot of material, and again... Like during any week in summer, I highly recommend and encourage that you watch it in installments. Next week, we have the end of the term. We'll talk about uh, ocean, glacial landforms, and also um, coastal landforms. That's basically what's coming next. Um, if you have any questions, come to the live office hour or send me an email. And I hope you take advantage of the videos that are available on the class YouTube playlist. Otherwise, I hope you're doing well and are staying healthy and enjoying your summer. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.